If you're watching this, laddie, we're in good shape. Let's not waste any time. My boys have set up an undercover depot closer to the Kilra homeworld. Keep your fingers crossed the Kilrathi hasn't found it, because there you will arm and load the T-bomb for the final run. I'll be talking to you again, I have no doubt.
objectives accomplished. Clearance to land. Excalibur, you are cleared to land. I told you you'd be seeing this old face again. By now the T-bomb loadout is complete. You're gonna have to lay it in there sweet and easy. As this tape plays, the coordinates are being downloaded to you. It's in your hands now, son. Send them all to hell.
In my bones, I wish to kill you. Do it then. It won't bring back your home world. <laughs> and a race without a home world. Unimaginable. The Kilrathi are a beaten race. And killing the one warrior great enough to bring about their end will bring me no honor. A new millennium lies ahead. We have become too corrupt and too much slaves to our bloodlust. And we have paid a heavy price. We are surrendering to you, heart of Kataika. It is an action unlike any we have ever taken. But it is time to kill Rocky, find new ways. To kill Rocky must not die out as a race. take a walk along the seashore I want to feel the sand between my toes and never see another bulkhead <laughs> <laughs> sounds good to me
Isn't that the guy from Star Wars? You'll never truly conquer Earth, you know. Not before you have to destroy it. Seven grips. Just the set one I left in Virgil Harper's set. Action. I've been with the Victory most of my career. I was communications officer on our maiden voyage. I'll admit, sir, I wasn't looking forward to the assignment, but now that I see you have a pilot as fine. Basically, as where Wing Commander 1 and Wing Commander 2 had movie-like aspirations, I would say that Wing Commander 3 is a movie that you're the star in, and that you'll sit down, you'll put your CD-ROM in the computer, and you'll play it, and you, you'll, you'll probably shake your head after the first 10 minutes and go, I'm, I'm playing a movie. Everyone talks about interactive movies and multimedia and all the rest of this stuff, and I think that no one's really sort of done anything that kind of defines it or makes a statement and what Wing Commander 3 is really trying to be in is when someone says what's an interactive movie I can just hand them the CDs and say hey check this out this is an interactive movie. Meeting with uh, Chris Roberts was uh, very positive for me because he he is Wing Commander. He created the game. He was he's going to be directing, and the way he explained it to me uh, fascinated me even more. It's exciting feeling like you're on the ground level of something that is new, uh, and I, to me it suggests so many different possibilities. So impressed with. The people that are, are, are performing in this, from Malcolm McDowell to John Reese davies and Tom Wilson, certainly one of the most instinctively uh, uh, funny 
actors I've ever worked with. I mean, this nothing that comes out of his mouth is not hysterically funny. So my acting challenge there is to keep a straight face while I'm doing a scene with him. Well, one way or another, we'll find out what Flash is made of. I guarantee you that. <laughs> Isn't that the guy from Star Wars? <laughs> 30 Apple, take one. How long was he behind me? For a long time. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. Oh, you're welcome. Guess what I'm wearing under this? I don't even want to know. Come on, get it. No. <laughs> you poisoned Tolwyn against me from the start, and he's had it out for me ever since. I've got news for you. Tolwyn had nothing to do with your lack of promotion. Your flying style took care of that for you. Tolwyn doesn't even know you're alive. Oh, that's what you think. Everybody knows about the maniac. Everybody. Uh -huh. How many people here know about the maniac, huh? Oh, oh, it's a mirror. <laughs> How many people here know about the maniac, huh? Anybody at all? Don't jump up all at once or anything, everybody. How many people here know about the maniac? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're ruining my movie, man. <laughs> there I was at the counter at Schwab's drugstore in Hollywood, much like Lana Turner was years gone by. And uh, Chris Roberts comes up and says, hey, how about being in an interactive CD-ROM uh, uh, computer sort of entertainment styled game film experience? Um, uh, my first reaction, of course, was to say, what? But um, no, then I agreed to do it. It's a lot of fun, actually. It's a very interesting thing for me, who's done, you know, a lot of feature films and a lot of different kinds of uh, entertainment, to actually come in to the uh, the world of uh, this interactive uh, computer stuff. Very interesting. I've done a lot of uh, green screen works, so I'm sort of used to it. I think it's it's really interesting to watch. Actually, through the monitor, you can see what the ship looks like, and then it's just pretending. Now you're climbing ladders that lead to nowhere, and yet if you look down on the monitor, you've got your ship right there. It's, 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 it's the very essence of what actors do. We pretend. It's amazing to see the final result and to be able to see it so quickly as well. You know, I, I'm imagining myself out there with just a green screen and then I go in and, and look at the footage and, and everything is there and it's, it's just unbelievable. I was very attracted to the character. I loved Rachel. She's, she's spunky, she's feisty, she's a mechanic. I wasn't quite sure what to expect and it's been a pleasant surprise. I think any reservations I had were about shooting a scene with several different endings and depending on how you play the game, who dies, how I feel about all of these different people at different times was, it was a little frightening, a little challenging. I think that it's challenging as far as the way scenes are shot Normally on a shoot, you have an act, a couple of actors, and the scenes are done back and forth. You work on one scene. This is shot primarily from one angle, and all of the different scenes consecutively, and then you turn around and shoot the other way. So at times, I've been a little confused as to which scene I'm shooting. Are we going to expand upon that moment? Are we going to kick in the afterburners here? Oh, <laughs> I must be out of my mind. I grew up with nothing but pirates. Deep down, you're all creeps. <laughs> Whatever you may think, Rachel and I are not mine. So where does that leave us? Pilots, 
rather crash and burn than make a commitment. I can't take the risk of getting involved with someone who might be on my way and there's too much at stake. One fifty-three, Frank. Take three. Are you starting from the middle again? No, we're starting from the end. No, we're starting from the beginning, aren't we? <laughs> well, <laughs> pick one. Oh, no. hey, it's an interactive decision-making process. I hate when we shoot like twenty-five scenes um, on the right side, and then we go back and we shoot the same twenty-five scenes. With another, with my close-up or whatever, I mean that's really difficult because generally you learn to sort of get into one idea and then you film all that and then you're done and then you go on to the next thing. But you might have a love scene, a scene where you kill someone, a scene where you're angry, a scene where you're happy, all in like very rapid succession. So that's yeah, it's super challenging. It's like mind-boggling. All our shields are down. We can't stop them. They're not taking my ship. Sir, what are you doing? Sir, we're heading right into their fleet. What are you doing? We'll take as many of them with us as we can. Make your peace. All with forms them. of acting are basically the same, but they, they, they all have a different approach. And the approach that you have here is that you have to be more flexible because you're going to play two different things. So you can't be as, as, as staunch one way and then not be able to recover from that and have to do the same thing on the same day. If you were doing it a different day, it's another story. But one moment when you're playing one thing this way and then you come back and you play it another way, you just have to be very flexible. And you have to do your homework. So they're not all like that. Yeah. All Basically, the truth of acting is in the listening. And when you have one set of possibilities, what the listening does is produce a response that is different each time. Now, with the interactive conversation, it goes to there and then it splits. One way, you're angry, your morale is high, you hit me. The other way, your morale is low, you don't hit me. And then it comes back again and continues. And because of the way, at the moment, people are shooting these things, um, they don't follow the, the different arcs all the way through in a different way. So what you as an actor have to do then is find a way of doing the end piece that works with that possibility and that possibility identically which is interesting. You and I, ape, have unfinished business. Now, I give you the chance. If you are a true warrior, you will take the challenge. You will see on your radar, I have sent my wingman off. The ancient test of courage is our The only limitations on it at present are the perennial limitations that we have in life, the limits of our own imaginations. One of the things that Chris has done for me is to open up uh, a set of different possibilities. A puny contingent of their soldiers has been captured here on Kilra. This incursion was an act of desperation. The hairless apes now fail about knowing that they are beaten. They have failed their race utterly. There will be no interrogation. Do what you will with them. It's basically when we were going to do the Karathi, obviously they're huge, fierce, cat-like, uh, alien creatures and so it's not going to be very easy to portray 
um, simply so. You know, we went out to a you know, uh, big Hollywood special effects house uh, who had a lot of experience doing this and asked them to uh, you know, build us the Karathi with you know, fully animatronic heads, which they have like all these remote control servos that control the mouth and the eyes. And then we had a computer system called Show Control that remember the puppeteer programs in all the mouth movements and fine tunes it and then it remembers it all and then it can just play it back on cue every single take. I was intrigued uh, indeed by the whole idea of doing this uh, computer game and I, I have a feeling that this is the way the movie business is going to go in the future. It's, this may save the movie business per se. I mean they probably won't do it all blue screen or green screen. They'll mix it you know with real sets and then the more expensive sets that they can't possibly afford to do will be done in this way with computers. Um, you just you have your own little imagination going, but you're in the middle of this incredible starship, you know, and out the window is another galaxy. So it's, it's fun to do. It's fun. I'm doing Star Trek at the moment, and that, the movie of it, and actually they've built the sets. What we see here on computer, they've built, and they're up to $35 million. When I direct a project, you know, I come up with the original concept and design, then I work with a lot of other bright, talented, creative people to sort of fulfill that, that sort of vision that I have for the project. And, um, you know, so I'll work with programmers and artists and musicians, and so we'll sort of break the project down into its parts, and I'll say, look, here, you're going to, uh, you know, go off and write the artificial intelligence for the bad guys. Here's my idea of what it should be like. And then usually the programmer will come back and say, here's the artificial intelligence, and, you know, if things work out well, he's gone and done something that's you know, five times better than I thought it was going to be and five times better than I was expected it to be. And I go, whoa, that's really great. The combination of the graphics in the space flight and the, the graphics with the silicon graphics that we did with the, uh, with the interiors of the ship and with the live action and everything else will actually give you a really complete experience. There's no place in the game really where you feel uh, like you're not actually there, like you're not actually on board the Victory and actually flying these missions. Technologically, it's, it's definitely a groundbreaker. I mean, just, uh, you know, the step into the Super VGA graphics. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, it, even to us, uh, developing it, it's, it's impressive, you know. And it's, it's actually a lot of fun for us to go into the game and play it. Uh, you know, so that with, with the 3D technology, that's, it's really, it's really taking leaps and bounds, you know, as to what we've been able to do in the past. I think one of the, one of the most important things is that the people developing the game are big game players themselves and so you know we take that enjoyment into mind when we're developing the software and, you know and try to think you know what's the user going to want you know what are they going to want to be able to do uh, so I think that's an important thing the main project we're working on is AI I've done all the artificial, artificial intelligence for um, all space objects, basically. The turrets, um, rear turrets, all fighter ships. Um, just making sure we get a, a good balance between uh, strong AI and playability. I mean, my initial reaction was to try and do really good AI where you just couldn't hit it. And uh, it quickly turned out that that wasn't much fun. It was difficult to try and get accurate AI not look like it was computer controlled AI. I was, I, we tried uh, very much to get some sort of personality in there. there right now there's about eight different uh, personalities that, that we based AI on. We try to make it feel like you're playing against people 
and uh, more so than actually computer-controlled AI. It's been interesting because I'm sort of in the gray area. Uh, this game essentially is operated in two different poles. You have the movie side of things and you also have the space flight. Uh, Gameflow kind of stands in the middle uh, between those two, uh, uses elements of both and administrates both elements, but is uh, still at the same time separate. And uh, it's been interesting trying to design a single unified system to control all of that at the same time. I think Wing 3 is the ultimate extension of what we have been doing up to this point, uh, having a spaceflight simulator with an interactive plot. Uh, I think it's just at the beginning of what is possible with interactive movies. It was a lot more grueling, I guess. I guess in retrospect, you know, I feel like we've accomplished an amazing amount. I mean, this was like... This one game has more artwork in it probably than all the other Wing Commanders and Special Operations Disc and all that stuff all you know, combined. You run into logistical difficulties when you're like working with a real model and that you have to you know, move cameras around and you know, blow smoke out and you only get you know, one take and if you screw up the one take then you've got to do it again and it costs an enormous amount of money. In our case what we do is we, uh, rather than going and constructing physical models, we go into the computer environment which is, you know, it's a simulated 3D environment. You actually build a model but you build it on the computer. So you actually have this full three-dimensional object, you know, with paint and, and lighting on it and everything. But it only exists, you know, in the computer's memory. And then where it becomes a, a, a benefit to you is that once you have that thing built in the memory, you can do pretty much anything you want to with it. Yeah, it's the biggest game in the industry ever so far. But uh, it's, you know, it's... it's it's always great at Origin to be able to work on the biggest games, you know, and that's exactly what this is right now. It really is like you're watching a piece of video from a movie. My whole theory behind film scoring, and this really is more like film scoring, I think, than writing for a game per se, even though it is called a game. I, my whole philosophy behind that is the music shouldn't interfere with what's going on and in terms of what I want the player to feel or whatever that person is feeling you know what at whatever point of the game is is perfectly logical and I just want the music to to sort of highlight that I know that everyone out there wants to do this. Not, I'm not sure whether they know how to do it right, just like we probably don't know how to do movies right. So I think the best answer is they want to do it, and if we want to do their stuff, it's kind of we meet in the middle. Um, so, you know, I think it's best if both parties share each other's knowledge, and I think then you'll get some, you know, truly awesome um, products.